Welcome back to another episode of Adoption Unfiltered. I am your co-host, Kelsey Vanderbilt Ranyard. I'm a birth mom, and we're here with Sarah Easterly, another co-host who's an adoptee, and Lori Holden, our third counterpart co-host who's an adoptive parent. And we have a really special guest today with us. We are so happy to welcome Dr. Patrice Martin to the show. Thank you, Dr. Patrice, for joining us. Thank you. Um, really briefly, I'll share um, some highlights. You've got a very extensive resume, um, but I will share some highlights of your of your bio. Uh, Dr. Patrice Martin is an adoptee advocate and nonprofit management scholar practitioner with over 25 years of experience in grants and program management. Her advocacy work in the adoptee community started in 2019 after her reunion with her biological family on the hit TLC show, Long Lost Family. Uh, we will definitely have a link to that in the show notes. Patrice is founder of the grassroots movement of the Adoptee Prayer Collective, which holds an online space for adoptees and others to pray, meditate, and hold space with each other before God. And she uses her voice to advocate before legislative bodies, most recently, very recently, testifying in the Tennessee State House of Representatives in opposition to the expansion of safe haven baby boxes in Tennessee. Um, such a, we'll put a link to that as well. It was captured on video and just an incredibly powerful testimony. So, um, you know, you've also been on lots of guests talking on podcasts. We'll put links to all of those things in the show notes, but um, let's dive in. I'm just so excited to talk with you, Patrice. Uh, again, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. I was wondering, um, of course, you've got a uh, a, a, a longer version of your adoption story on the TLC show and in other places, but would you probably best to just start with your adoption story um, at a high level, if you don't mind sharing that? Surely. Um, I've always known that I was adopted. Um, my parents told me, you know, at the young ages, you know, when I can um, understand that. But my origin story is that I was um, born to... Um, my birth mother actually had me on the bathroom floor of her apartment that she was living in. Um, and she already had a daughter who was two years old. She had just started a career um, as an RN, a nurse, and she didn't have the best shifts and everything. She had also started dating um, some person at work, but still was trying to focus on her career. And um, from what I understand, um, because my father is deceased too, I never actually met him. Um, it, they just, you know, started a relationship. She got pregnant, but she hid it from even him. Um, and really already knew that she had, you know, this, her daughter, my sister, and um, was also helping to take care of her mother at the time. It was just a lot she had on her um, and just wasn't even thinking, you know, a little rationally. And um, so she um, hit her pregnancy when, um, and prior to that, she, I guess she, you know, knew that at some point she was going to come, come do um, and ask um, for a random like day off, I guess could feel, you know, that things are starting to come and she didn't get that day off. So she had me um, on the bathroom floor and cut the cord and, um, and she had me in the morning and went to work later that day. Um, she put me in a box, dressed me in my sister's clothes and put me in a box in the behind a mall. Um, and my sister says that, you know, it's around behind a store that I think it's some people that she knew. Um, but then I think, you know, um, she kind of got her wits about her and describes her voice. And in the article that's in the paper about um, me, um, it says that somebody anonymously called around 8.50 in the morning. Um, so I guess she was her own uh, safe haven type uh, uh, person. But um, I learned that, learned that story, um, learned that story. Actually, I've always known that I was adopted, but learned my, that, that part of the story that I was abandoned probably in about... Um, about 26, 27 years old. My adoptive mom told me then. And then um, I learned the rest of the details of that story when I got reunited with my sister on the TLC show. 
Um, one thing of note um, is that my mother um, also had another child after me. Um, she remained in a relationship with that man and she had, I have a brother, a full sibling. Um, and uh, she kept him um, at the time and um, really, really suffered greatly um, after my sister said that it was almost like she just wasn't the same after she had done what she did. Um, so she um, had some mental health struggles and, um, and, you know, some substance abuse struggles, but my siblings ended up in foster care and um, they, my mother ended up getting, um, cleaning up and getting herself together and, you know, got them back. And um, she had a therapist that encouraged her to tell her children that they had a sister. So my sister that you see that I'm reunited with had been looking for me for 20 plus, almost 30 years, you know, but she, um, there's a lot of, you know, I try to tell her part of the story. She um, passed away, um, actually, um, four months after I met her. That's a whole nother part of the story. Um, but we were reunited. We got a chance to talk and I saw her twice in my life. Um, and I, I just really try to tell her story because she's not here with as much dignity as I can. Um, but I do the part that I can is to um, advocate for. Now I really believe very strongly for women and children. So It's such a powerful story that you have and you do tell it with such care. Um, I, I was really struck by that when I watched the video of you sharing parts of that story, um, both in on the house floor as well as in the show. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, you, I was, I just kept thinking you are the perfect spokesperson. Um, and I know you're going to be doing a lot more of that because you are the perfect spokesperson for having lived experience in the very thing that um, is being debated by people who don't have, you know, I think they're well-meaning people sometimes, but they don't have that lived experience perspective that you offer. So um, could you tell us a little bit about how you came to find yourself on, you know, at the house, the state house um, and sharing your testimony and why it was relevant for the baby box, um, the expansion of the baby boxes? Let me just back up a little bit to put this in context um, for people who are not steeped in this the way we all are. Um, Part of why we wrote our book, Adoption Unfiltered, was to um, give nuance and complexity to the win-win narrative of adoption. And I think what you went into in that hearing, Patrice, and what I'm going to go into in a hearing here in my own state mm -hmm. this coming week, is this overall idea that adoption is good, adoption is wonderful, adoption is win-win. And it is it can be those things, but it's not only those things, as, as Sarah has said before with us. So um, we know that in many cases, it's it's not great mm -hmm. for birth parents. We know we're, we're starting to accept that it's not great for adoptees because of that separation. And um, the pressure, the, the narrative that we have is from kind of the adoptive parents and the adoption professionals who, um, you know, have a vested interest in there being a supply of babies to be adopted. So um, when you know, nobody does want infanticide, we don't want a mother who doesn't have any other options to, to, to infanticide. We want her to have other options. And um, parenting can be one of those if we do some support better. But um, we already have safe haven laws. And, and I was wondering, would somebody want to talk about the difference between safe haven laws and baby boxes and how those two are connected? Yeah, people don't really realize that safe haven laws are different than the baby box and mm -hmm. and the that the safe haven alliance doesn't have um a positive relationship with the baby box organization mm -hmm. at all um and in many ways in the public um just in the public baby box organization has tried to hitch their wagon to safe haven mm -hmm. um and how the and how they present data and how they and how they 
try to win over certain groups and organizations there's and and in the views of state legislators as well so safe haven was implemented in like the the laws were implemented i believe in 1998 and the last state that ratified it, I want to say, was like 10 years later. So in a span of like 10 years, all the 50 states have ratified the safe haven laws. Um, and which so, is what? I'm sorry? Which is what? Which is where um, a mother can do a safe handoff to, um, and, and every state's different. Every state has different laws of what where those handoff locations are. But um, typically you'll see like a fire station, an emergency room, um, and some some states have extra places and extra rules about how it goes down and when it can happen um, as far as it can only be in the first 48 hours after birth or it can be in the first six months. And there, there have been problems where states did not put the age into the um, into the law and then somebody I think in Nebraska tried to drop off their 16 year old as a case um but the the whole purpose around this was to combat uh rising levels of infanticide that were happening in the 80s and 90s um uh, women that were in distress mental health severe mental health issues or they were um dealing with psychosis and in the 80s and 90s we just we didn't have um I don't think I think we have a really a lack of creativity sometimes with our policy and and this was their solution granted this um the the numbers of infanticide did go down over the course of time with the safe haven laws being ratified and being implemented um but safe haven allows you to make a legal um surrender of the baby without being um charged with abandonment Mm -hmm. And so it's that safe handoff. And typically what will happen is that baby goes into state care. So the foster care system, um, there are a few states that have changed that and allow them to go into private adoption agencies. I believe Indiana is one of them, but um, those are recent things. The baby box company um, was, I believe, incorporated in around, around 2016. And so any data that they're presenting about that they are a part of the mitigation of infanticide data is is simply untrue because 2016 was, you know, approximately eight years ago. Um, and so there is no way that because they've been contributing to those numbers and there's no way because causation is not the same as correlation. And so we can't... Um, we can't say for sure if, even if our numbers continue to go down, that the baby boxes were the reason for that happening. Um, there's plenty of concerns um, ar around these boxes, mainly that they they promise anonymity, which we know is not something that can be promised in this day and age. And also because of that promise of anonymity, who's dropping this child off? And and um, what happens next? Um, there's and and Sarah and Patrice, I know you guys can speak to the identity portion mm -hmm. and and how that plays out for adoptees in the long term. Um, but these are the basics of that's the background of safe haven laws. Quite a few people the past couple of days have asked me, you know, how did you find yourself? I I honestly showed up like I. I honestly showed up as an individual citizen that this happened to. Now, yes, I have tentacles and I have wonderful support. Um, and I'm a part of, I call us as adoptees, I call us a movement. So I'm a part of all of us, all of us in the constellation. We're all connected. You know, I, I believe that I advocate for us, but I have always believed in the power of voice and actually I was thinking about this. One of my first actions that I actually went to was for years ago, I went to the March for Children um, with a group when I worked as an uh, as a mentor with 
a bunch of youngsters and I saw like the power of just being able to see how people come together, like physically see that around a cause. So that always struck me. And then after that, I got a chance to do grant work in the domestic violence um, space. And I really learned about the importance of advocating for something and how that will affect your everyday life and affect, you know, money and dollars. Like I was applying for grants that were appropriations. I learned all about appropriations at the federal, state, and local level, you know, and that's when I think I really understood the power of, you know, dollars towards a situation. Um, here recently, um, in 2019, after the experience that I had of being on the show and really understanding some things about myself and how we really um, were affected, um, how all of us are really affected, you know, um, in the adoptee space, I it really started to, I'm always been that one that we got to go get them. We got to tell them, you know, that's just been part of my personality. So that meshed with uh, me understanding the power of those things. I think that just natural is a natural fit. I am going to be very honest. My, um, I have some family ties um, to the state house here, but I always would at family gatherings, I would mention, I'd say, I'm coming. I was like, I'm, I'm coming my adoptee buddies, you know, I'm coming with something because we got to fix the system for these kids. You know, my friends always laugh because I was like, we got to fix this system, you know? Um, but that's, you know, but when I saw this one, ladies, when I saw this one, I said, yep, I got to go. I've got to go. Well, I'm so glad you did. It was the best part of the hearing. Uh, I was like, I, I, people send me a lot of videos like, you got to watch this. And I'm like, yeah, I will later. And then I don't do it. And then Sarah was like, did you watch it? And I was like, no. And so I <laughs> finally was like, okay, I'm going to go watch it. I'm going to set aside time. And I was just like blown away. I, I was so just this. I, I just felt like you were in the the right place, the right time, mm. the perfect person, the perfect story, the perfect experience and the perfect way of telling it. Because I just I work in policy in the domestic adoption space. I, I do uh, public policy work. And I do legislation and I seek enforcement and I'm always trying to be bipartisan because it's the only way to get stuff done federally. And I never have seen a bipartisan committee scratch their heads as much as they did. And I was just fascinated and it was awesome. It was so awesome. And I just feel like you were just uh, there for a reason honestly um it was just awesome to watch um one thing i one thing because i'm also an advocate and i work in that space um it can be such a contentious space um and you know we have competing interests and then sometimes we have we think we have competing interests but sometimes we're all on the same team and we don't really mm -hmm. realize it um so I just want to know from you, uh, is any advice that you would have for advocates who want to do what you've done? They want to help that general public, the people that don't have lived experience. They want to help them understand our arguments, understand our perspectives, um, and meet us with that same compassion and gentility that you were met with, which I was just, my mind is still blown about. But um, how how do we... How do we become approachable in our advocacy work? I think, honestly, in terms of me, I'm not like super pro at this. I just showed up um, as me. So that's one thing that everybody should know is what you saw there. Um, my my girls were like, yeah, that's her. You know, she's, do she's doing, that's what she does. Um, and I think one of the things that I try to do is I always try to look at, honestly, this may sound really crazy, but 
is that who's being marginalized here? Who's not, who's missing out? Who's not being loved here, you know, from a spiritual perspective, you know? Like who is really going to miss out here? I really do try to look at situations or what's missing here. And I think there's a piece of that whole video that really, really, I was, I was in my seat, like on the edge of my seat in the, in the um, room when the um, legislator that had put the bill up, he was talking, but he kept saying things like, well, if the moms already gave the babies and I'm paraphrasing here, cause I don't really remember exactly his words, but you know, just leave them be. And here I am sitting here as a, yeah, I'm an adoptee. I'm a, you know, consider myself an adoptee. But I just, I, I'm an adoptee advocate, but I just don't see how you do that. Me being, a, first of all, me being a woman, you're talking about women, you know, that are in crises. And then those are our mothers you're talking about. Well, and how many, I mean, as long as, we've had space and time <laughs> people have been in rooms with the closed door making decisions about us without our input without our testimony without mm -hmm. our you know i don't know just we haven't been invited to the discussions about ourselves mm -hmm. and so and, and about our about our mothers and about you know what i mean so um i think Sometimes too, I think in general in advocacy spaces, when you are on the fringe and you haven't been heard and you haven't been listened to, mm -hmm. it's easy to, to fester and to be like, they don't want me there. They don't, they don't want to hear me. They don't, they don't, they're never going to listen. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm on the fringe and I'm, I have too much of a chip on my shoulder to be heard, but like, I don't know have we tried like let's we have to keep trying to go back we have to keep going back and keep yeah. being heard and keep because the goal we have to keep the goal in mind like we yeah. have to get them to understand so how do I get them to understand you know yeah you know what I'll say about that I realized this week that um having done this that there are some people like that and that's okay for those of us that still want to keep trying I'm going for you there are some of our adoptees, of friends, you know, people are like, why would you even go down there? This isn't going to do anything or whatever. Now, to their shock and amazement and mine as well. I don't even think I was so focused on, I knew that it was crap that, you know, there would have been some money put behind this bill at the last minute and all that other kind of stuff. And I knew that's what I was fighting for. And I wasn't, but I just felt like they have to hear. They're doing this stuff because they don't, I don't know. That's really what was driving me. Like they have to hear that this is not, this is not okay. And, yeah. and don't make this decision without hearing me. And don't make this yeah. decision without hearing me. And when you watch the videos, one of the striking things that happened was they started focusing on the nitty gritty so they were like so how are you sure if you put this baby in the box who comes and gets it how long will they be like this is all stuff that they never they were prepared and i heard beforehand this was gonna go yeah i'm, I'm telling this was gonna go until you came in yeah <laughs> So I came in and, you know, some others, the, 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 the safe um, haven group, you know, there, mm -hmm. but yeah. I listened to the testimony as well. And we've seen um, so many times adoptees, uh, we make assumptions about adoptees and we use adoptees on the side of an issue that we um, make into a dichotomy. Like, would you rather have been this or that? Would you rather have been but in a trash can or whatever. And so I think people tend to assume that you would feel one way about this as happens in other cases too. So um, I love how you entered into that space of complexity um, and you, you zeroed in on the whole part 
of the person to person handoff. And that when you're a newborn and your whole world has been connection and you enter separation for the first time, any more separation is outsized in the template for your life. So you really focused in on those two minutes without any connection. And I just, I really appreciated how you did that. Um, that was a pit that was really meaningful to me. Mm, thank you. Yeah. And it's, um, that seems to be a real sticking point for others too, Lori. Like I've gotten questions about, can you put, you know, on social media, can you put um, reference to that study that you, you know, referenced and all that? And I can give you that, you know, as well to, to reference in the, about, um, you know, the, the con how important the continuum of um, having uh, certain stimulation, you know, stimulations helps, you know, you thrive. Um, I think that was important. I take a step back. That was the research behind it. But another adoptee was with me that Jennifer uh, Ghostin was with me and she has a wonderful podcast. She was with me and she just looked at me and said, talk about putting babies in a box. <laughs> and I'll say to you that that, when she said that, that even put it to me. Yeah, that's like icky. <laughs> like all the way around. That, that, that somebody would even think that this is an alternative to, you know, the situation. Yeah, because it is when you say it out loud, like, I mean, we've jumped right into the, the amazingness that you got to and the change of heart you were able to bring about. But like saying out loud what the baby boxes is, it's almost like, is this even real in this day and age? Like that's. But that's um, what you saw with those legislators. They yeah, started. Right. They kind of got it. Yeah. But like, we're literally talking about boxes and babies being abandoned with no ties. And mm -hmm. then there's no checks to make sure is the, who is per dropping off the, you know, I mean, there's really, it's really terrifying. It's really wicked. And I think back to Kelsey's point, something that she said that really made me think was, you know, a lot of times people go up to legislation with their you know, their stance and their, for whatever reasons, right? I think a lot of people came in that room on the surface. I keep saying this on the surface, this might sound like a good idea, especially if, okay, we've outlawed certain policies that we might have a plethora of babies. So, and moms are in, you know, they're not even, and the other language that they are not using that I want us to all use is, Let's start talking about mothers in crisis. Mothers having mental health crises at that moment. Psychosis. Not, and psychosis. And they're not supported. Not to demonize the mom, not to make no. them seem like, but to call a spade a spade, to call it what it is. There's a break that happens, even if there's a mom that, you know, it's 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 a fear response. So, so what's going on around you? So let's start calling that. So when you put that in that terms, that takes a whole different shape than, yeah, this is a, this is goes along with that, you know, right to life kind of conversation or whatever. See, some of those people might still even be on that same line, but they were like, not this idea. And I saw them. And I think that that's what happens when you just present the facts of what something is. And that fact of a mom, because the you know, child is not outside yet. You know what I mean? But it's a it starts with a mom in crisis. Another thing that I think you did so well um, is you kind of, and, and it kind of goes along with what you just said. It, you broke down the barriers of their binary thinking. You split your party line. You blew it wide open for them. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've seen with the baby box arguments, the pros and the cons is it's the same thing over and over again. We've seen the same thing and it's just, there's no connection, right? Um, between the arguments and everything. There's no tearing down those walls that's been done in an effective way until now. Um, and what we witness 
from the pro argument is that false dilemma fallacy, which is like, these are our only two options. Babies are killed and abandoned yes. in infanticide, or you put them in this box. Yes. And that's all we have. So if you don't put this baby in this box, you're advocating for children to be put in dumpsters or the like. Did, did and you? you yeah busted that wide open and said, these are not our only options. Let's be serious adults about this issue. Yeah. Let's be serious policymakers about this issue. Yes. And let's navigate it with the resources that we absolutely do have. And the and the, um, the frameworks and the people and the organizations waiting to help, um, prepared to help. Let's, yeah. let's, let's bolster that. And I think that was what was the for me the most brilliant thing was blowing away that false false dilemma um mm -hmm. because that's been concrete in every state that that yeah. these leg this legislation has passed that false dilemma has won over and i just i don't think it can it, i just think it's blown up yeah. now <laughs> in my it's, mind it, it is it is and and you're you're right because I don't know if you even remember the legislator that looked at me and I, I kind of had to, I, I wasn't being rude. I, I, I had to laugh in the back of my head, but he said, so you mean to tell me that if we possibly fund programs, kids won't end up in the system at all? I said, yeah. Now, this is not the first time that they've heard this. All of them know if they're on right. the children and health subcommittee, you know, children's subcommittee, you've heard about early head start. Hmm. That's a zero to three program that provides in home and um at um at child care centers, you know, for limited low income moms or whatever, you know, can apply to be in that zero to three. There's other programs, there's early, early child care programs, you know. You've heard about funding them. You probably even said we're not funding them, you know, in some regard. But I don't think that it's exactly what you said, Kelsey. They're not making the linkage between, that's the real linkage, not the, you know, the extreme. That's the real linkage because it's the moms in crises. You don't end up, a baby can't end up out there if someone doesn't put them there. So how do we prevent people from putting them there? The, you know, the promises of anonymity um, and what that does for an adoptee um, and, yeah. and wrestling with your identity. Yeah, th there is that piece. And then, you know, even if you just think about, you know, this day and age that we live in, you know, DNA is out there. People are going to find you. That's a whole different podcast episode but um what okay so my ultimate stance is funding for pregnant moms in crises so we don't have to get here right that's my like rainbows blue sky thing we don't even have to be talking about this anymore but since we know that that can happen. I'm on the side of the nonprofit safe haven groups um, to be funded and and funded well. And one of the things that um to your point that they were advocating for was there was in this bill that we were fighting against, there were two million dollars tucked in so that um, there could be baby boxes in every county all over Tennessee, okay? And then an additional eight firefighters. We'll talk about that at another time. But the safe haven group that was there that said, look, we don't even need all your 2 million, but we just want, we have 1,500 sites that have we train law enforcement, firefighters, um, hospitals, professionals, everybody that's been trained sites all over Tennessee that we could put more education and advocacy, you know, ed education dollars in 
to get the word out. You know, we can have ad campaigns. We can, because to be honest, where do you guys in your regular every day? I mean, you, unless you go in the hospital, you might see it, but where do you see signs that have safe haven? None of us see them anywhere. And it's because the funding's not there. They'll do the education with the medical professionals, but the funding isn't out there to just have the information out there that this is, there are, there's an organization that can help you. Now, in that respect, and we talk about anonymity, I think they will help keep anonymity better um, than doing that. Because if you have a box in a wall, who's to say that there's not a camera in um on the street that is pointing right at that box or right at of course someone a that you got of a someone that gets on um sorry someone uh -huh. gets on tiktok every time there's a surrender to tell everybody oh about. so we're what okay so the other piece and i'll say this is independent citizen you know i know you guys work in a space i don't want to put you guys in the hole but there's a lot of controversy around the company that manufactures these boxes because they do press releases. So say you're in a small town and you know that Susie's been pregnant and Susie's not pregnant anymore. And there's only 400 people in a small town in Tennessee. Um, somebody's going to deduce that, you know, like really? Yeah, so and that, you wanted to do so that's Susie's baby. Like it that, doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, they don't have the 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 mother that it that's in crisis or the child even in mind with it. When I think of those press releases and when I think of how um the sponsor introduced the bill and was very um excited about having two drop-offs already um in a certain amount of time as if that were a good thing and i think if you are looking at this with one eye that win-win eye you're going to crow about it but if you're looking at it with both eyes and you're looking at it with from a from a more critical perspective like you're willing to dive into it and see what it what other ramifications it has um that's not a sign of success that's a sign of failure yeah it's a sign of failure and that's actually what they were trying the 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 non safe even nonprofit. I believe now I'm not going to put words in their mouth. We're trying to say without saying that because they don't want to seem like they're coming in conflict with them as much. But I as in it, that's why I love being the independent citizen saying it, and I will say it as a, what I saw is that it comes in direct conflict with that. It comes in direct conflict with the people that are really out here. Um, caring uh, for moms and caring about children because we know all of us know that um, it just is not good to be leaving babies alone like that in a strange place even for two minutes would you do it some of some folks would I said this to somebody this is part of my sense of humor but I said some of y'all wouldn't even leave your dog alone for two minutes. Let it, you know, not not comparing children to dogs at all, but you know what I'm trying to say here. And I think some of them got that, like, no. And then you, you know, the other thing that I've really been thinking about since I gave testimony is wow, you know, we have a lot of this touches a lot of areas, but there's like a lot of areas around like human trafficking and all this other kind of stuff. Like who's to say that somebody's pimp or something just could take their kid from them and put them in the box and then put them there, you know, like that, that would, that would encourage that. Yeah. You won't have that encouraged yeah. if you have to give yeah. a face to face handoff. I'm not saying yeah. that people can't coerce people, but a little bit different. Yeah. And I was, I worry about domestic violence situations yeah. or just ven vengeance. I mean, vengeance. It's, it could, there could be any number of abuses that wouldn't be uncovered through, you know, through that, that anonymous system. Yeah. It's really terrifying. Um, before we started recording, Patrice, you were mentioning um, that there were other things you had prepared that you weren't able to address. 
Um, and, and I think it's, it's fascinating just knowing your background with your doctorate in business administration and um, your experience with public administration and nonprofit management um, that, you know, just some fiscal, some fiscal things mm -hmm. that, that you, you know, you, there just wasn't simply wasn't time for um, mm -hmm. in, in to address. Is there anything you could say about that now or that you want to share? about? Yeah. That now? So what I really focused on, I hit on it, but I really didn't. I said, you know, I really wanted to see that the shift of the funds that were behind this bill added at the last minute, I might add you, um, were to support zero to three programming that we could um, fund programs such as Early Head Start to provide mothers and children. And, and, and one thing that I love about, I used to work in Head Start funding, but one of the things that I love about Head Start is it's under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is not under the Department of Ed. So what it does is it provides that holistic um, health, you know, from zero to three, really focusing the zero to three um, space to focus on the mental health of the moms, the kids, the child developmental, the nutrition and counseling and coaching. Because when you feel safe, like you have enough food, enough resources, there's some things that turn different for you um, in the choices that you make. Um, surprise, you know, and provide supports. They had a fatherhood initiative in there, you know, that's not even something we even touched about. You know, there were, my dad never knew I existed. He died and did not know he had a daughter. He had some other daughters, but he didn't know about me. And so, you know, yes, there are dynamics to certain relationships, but, you know, there are other supports for fathers now that really cause them to pause and say, give them the supports to say, you know what? I think I can be a dad. I think I can be a dad in this situation. Um, and so in earmarking the money um, for, I said, mentioned the uh, partnering with Tennessee Child Care Task Force. Um, my mom had me on the floor and then went to work. Enough said, you know, when I talked about um, you know, I mentioned that the country of Finland has this happiness scale and that um, one of the reasons why they're really high on the happiness scale, they're like the happiest country um, around they were rated, was because they have these social supports. And one of the social supports that they have is universal child care. Um, and that contributes to everybody's sense of happiness and well-being. Um, so you don't have to literally make these kind of decisions. So um, there is funding already, grant mark, uh, gr grant money uh, for the Tennessee Child Care Task Force. And so we need to um, maybe even take some of that money and bolster that program. Um, build stronger partnerships with nonprofits and faith communities. We saw a nonprofit that showed up there. Um, if that money was directed towards even half of that money was directed towards a really a campaign across all of Tennessee with the 1500 sites that they said they've trained safe haven, you know, folks at. Imagine what you could do, even with a million of that, 500,000 with that. Um, so do more, you know, and, and I do have a, a part of my advocacy that reaches to the faith community. I believe that one of the ways that people are going to prevent is that if we turn the narrative on some of the shame language that we've had around some of these narratives, that's a whole different podcast as well, um, I believe. And then I said also shift the dollars to two to three more positions within the maternal and child health space at the Department of Health so that outreach can be done in places like Meharry, Vanderbilt, and um, places like Tennessee State. Tennessee State, I saw had, um, that's a HBCU, here in Nashville, they have um, people doing research on um, social determinants of health. Those are the things that, you know, all moms need, all kids need to thrive, right? Um, and so looking at that, especially for women in marginalized populations, because a lot of times people feel under, that are under-resourced um, feel like that. So that was what in a longer term, I hit on some of that, but I really would have liked to talk about that um, 
because that's really to give them. I want to, I always give people, no, I don't want to complain about what you're not doing, but I want to tell you, since you have the power, that's what I was trying to say. You have the power. This is what you can do. Well, you, um, I mean, you didn't get to get to all that, but you, what you did share, I mean, that put me in a happy place hearing you articulate so well, and then seeing the responses um, from the different representatives who really, you could see it, you could see the the change mm -hmm. and the, the grasping it. Um, so it was really inspiring. So just back to speaking of, you know, Finland and happy and I felt happy. How did you feel? I mean, just in closing, like, how was it for you? You know what? I, I love that question. I did feel happy. And I, I want to say this because this is all this is for this is for Sarah. This is for our people. This is for our people, our group. When I got to mention and it was very small, but everywhere I go, I will always say. You're talking about children, but they eventually grow into being adults. Adults that adoption affects us. And I talk, got a chance to mention about the fact that we, a lot of us suffer with complex PTSD and there are other things. And I will not stop saying that. I will not stop saying that. I will not stop saying it too. I love the fact that you have been, that, that Lori is here specifically because I feel like if we're parented out of a different space or people know that when they're parenting us, not that you give people a pass or, you know, something like that to not still want people to be the best that they can be, but just know what they come with. That there's an understand that you're not here to even fill that gap, but you're here to just help somebody along that journey because you can't fix that to my knowledge. You can't undo that. And somebody is not with their biological family. There are things scientifically we know. You can't undo it. But you, they, you can be stable. You can be raised well, but you can be raised well knowing that. And anytime I get a chance to speak out because it's a hidden thing, that's the other hidden thing is that there's all these people walking around here who were adopted and they were raised and they're not saying anything and they're not in touch with what's really affecting their life. They, Thank you. Thank you for saying all that. It is so important that we understand each other to, um, especially when we're talking policy making here, yes. that we understand the the truth and the nuances and all of the, um, not just the shiny part of it. I just thought of one last minute question for you, Patrice, and this this probably can be short, but you know, there are subsets of people in adoption for diff what kinds of adoption they're, what role they play and what their circumstances are and things like that. Is there a group of people um, with your experience that you are in touch with? I'm just curious about that. Um, with your, with my experience, you mean in... of, of 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 your experience in this in the, in any time period of being abandoned by your birth mom because oh better... there are other that's why I, um my name up here there are other what we call foundlings that's what you call that that subset of the. Um, community of people who have been abandoned at birth. Oh yeah, there are foundlings. Out I there. did not know that. I did Thank not you. know. Yeah. So good. we're another inside the inside the adoptee group that has their own set of you know um, kind of things. I'm in touch. One I call she and I call each other twin, but um, Iris is amazing. She has a, a ministry out of North Carolina, and she's an amazing woman and. Um, Iris Bryant and I was on her podcast before and she definitely speaks out about it does work in that space um, there's a couple of you know folks there was even a, a founding podcast you know I corresponded with them but there are others um, out there um, and then there are people that just don't know you know what it's what it's called but that's um, like yes, me that is, so yeah. in, in the foundling space is there 
consensus or not consensus about baby boxes? Ah, you know, I don't, I don't, well, the ones that I've talked to are like, yeah, that's crazy. Thank you. You know what I mean? Um, because they're on that side of it. Um, I, the person that I know of that has the safe haven baby box, um, organization is actually a foundling. I don't know her personally. Um, so that might be interesting, um, to, to, you know, to talk with that person and, and see, you know, their why. But, um, I do think that that makes it very interesting for me, um, in the angle that I'm coming at, which is a little different because you would think, I mean, on its surface years ago, you know, I heard about this just I heard about this years ago and when they were doing it Asian, I was like, oh, wow, this is in an Asian country that, um, I was doing this and I forget which country and I don't want to misspeak. So that's why I said Asian, but um, there was, you know, some of the head, this box, there was a whole movie about it and everything. And, you know, when I saw it, I was kind of moved like, oh, wow, this is what, you know, the political climate, you know, it got, you know, drawn them to. I really didn't have that same visceral reaction then when I heard about it years ago. And thought it, you know, quite frankly, on its surface, thought it might be a good thing. Okay, I understand why people are doing that. And then after I really, really sat with it, and that's the other thing too, is allow yourself to have the critical thinking skills to really think about what a policy is, you know, in general, and, and what it's really doing to the people that it's, um, that it's addressing. Critical thinking and listening to stories. And then for those of us with the lived experience, sharing our stories. And we heard that from Greg Luce, who was a guest uh, not so long ago too, just the power of constituent storytelling. And you are such proof of that. And um, I'm just so thankful to know you, Patrice, and and uh, and for all of thank, the work that you've thank done. Thank you all. And thank you for the, the work that you're doing. And I will say... Um, I was an independent person, but definitely was able to draw on my community and Greg and Adoptees United. I want to give them a shout out. Um, and also um, Marley Griner for the work that she has done because she really, really is the catalyst behind people even knowing about this. So I just, I want to, I have to give, you know, honor to where it's due. Well, we so appreciate your shedding light into a place that people already thought they knew something about it. Um, that's something we love to do. So thank you for being with us today, Patrice. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, wherever you're listening or watching, please like it or rate it or share it to help others find Adoption Unfiltered. It's through healthy engagement that we can make the changes needed for everyone affected by adoption. Visit adoptionunfiltered.com for our other episodes and more information about our other projects, including our book, Adoption Unfiltered.